thanks uh, for coming and thanks a lot for having me here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be amongst the fellow Lispers. And uh, my name is Derj and uh, I'm Polish, so my England speaks not too happily, <laughs> but I hope you can cope with that. Uh, and I'm a scheme programmer. Uh, I'm proud to hack at FIDO Labs, which is the uh, AI uh, language understanding startup. Uh, to put things short, uh, our AI something something enables you to ask questions to uh, textual content. So uh, I don't mean things like uh, Obama was born in Hawaii, I think, but uh, also more sophisticated forms of uh, linguistic behavior like, I'm sorry, thanks for that feature, I would give you a higher rating if blah, blah, blah. Uh, so if you're interested, we'll be organizing a meetup soon. Uh, so just stay tuned or you can drop me an email uh, or contact part of our crew. Uh, and uh, okay, um, today's topic is uh, something, 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 lisp something. So it's interesting by definition. <laughs> uh, and uh, actually, it's, it's not about Lisp, uh, but hopefully uh, you will find it uh, you know, interesting. So in order to start, we need uh, a simple uh, Lisp interpreter. So it's a lexical, pure uh, Lisp variant. Uh, I use the convention of the ancient Lisp interpreters, so I represent uh, the Boolean values by T and the, the nil. Uh, so just watch for it. And uh, our dialect uh, supports a few primitive operations. Uh, the ones for dealing with lists, car, coder, cons, and some uh, arithmetic stuff, and uh, atoms comparison, and ordering of numbers, and predicates to recognize atoms and numbers. So OK, the heart of the uh, how many of you have never implemented a Lisp interpreter before? Okay, a few. Uh, I was thinking about doing a, a, a live coding session, but I was afraid that I'm going to freak out, so I just will show you how it works. And perhaps we will do some live coding later on when I stop shaking. Uh, the heart of the interpreter is the evaluation function. It takes a, a Lisp expression and it takes some environment and uh, returns the expression that is the value of the input expression with respect to this environment. Uh, as you can see, we are having two environments, in fact, and this I will explain in a minute, but just uh, how does the thing work? The value of nil is nil, the value of t is t, numbers evaluate to themselves, uh, and closures as well. Closure is internal representation of a closure. Uh, but I think you get the idea. And now uh, the symbols are meant to mm, work as variables. So, uh, sorry. Uh, so the value of uh, a symbol is just, uh, you know, you look up the environment for that symbol and find out what it is. However, I wanted uh, the symbols representing the primitive operations uh, to evalu evaluate to themselves and in order not to uh, not to construct uh, this environment with self-evaluating uh, objects, I just hacked it with, hacked it with if, this one. Okay, now the three special forms of uh, most Lisp implementations, I think. Uh, it's the quote form, and the quoted expression evaluates to the expression. Uh, it's the uh, conditional expression. So uh, if the value of this guy over here is uh, nil, then we evaluate the else branch, otherwise we uh, evaluate the then branch. And uh, uh, the most important special form of all special forms, the lambda, it simply creates closure. So it takes uh, this lambda and its uh, current local environment, buys them in, in, a, in a nice pack, and, and that's it. Everything else you have in your uh, Lisp program is just an application. So what do you do? when you have an application? Well, first, you evaluate all of its components, so the operator and each of the operands. And then you just look what, what, what uh, what's the result. So it might be uh, 
an application of primitive operation, in which case you just you know, perform the operation. And uh, it might be a closure, like this one. And uh, what's the value of a closure? Well, you evaluate its body, the body of the lambda which created the closure, with respect to the new environment, consisting of, first of all, binding of argument names and their values, and the enclosed uh, environment that was in this closure. And that's, that's all. I guess we can evaluate that. Uh, is there anyone using a geyser environment in Emacs? You don't know geyser. Okay, so if you like what you see, how geyser takes care of me, then uh, I can share my .emacs file with you. Uh, it's an uh, incredibly um, efficient way of hacking a scheme uh, using uh, Emacs with geyser because you know I can just type in some uh, expression and evaluate. You get the results All down here. Ah. So it's very useful because you know you can just be sitting inside of your program and modifying it. Uh, okay, so let's see if the thing actually works. 59, that sounds fair. And that's the application of <laughs> that's okay. Uh, ah, yes, that's fine. Uh, so now uh, we do have the evaluation function, which is the core of the interpreter. Now we would like to have uh, some procedure which receives a program in our small list and some inputs and you know evaluates the program. So the convention I have used is that the program is uh, a list of definitions. Uh, definitions uh, just consist of uh, a variable and some expression that is being bound to it. And uh, the last definition is the, uh, is the uh, initial part of the program. So uh, the, the inputs of the program become arguments for this last um, procedure. Okay, so uh, how do we go about running a program? We simply need to build a top environment. That is the environment of this uh, procedures. Probably some constants because you know it could work like this. It's it's nasty, but you could you know, just uh, define some constants constants in here. But the main uh, theme is to build the top environment with uh, procedures. So we start with the empty environment, and then we pick. Uh, procedures, we pick definitions one after another, uh, we take the variable from it, which is the second element of a list, uh, we pick up the expression, the third element, evaluate it with empty local environment and the top environment built so far, we actually could have the empty list in here, but if you would like to have constants in your program, then probably they, they will be uh, constructed by some previously defined procedure. Uh, and what do you do? You update the environment that you already had with respect to this variable. Uh, you bind it with the newly evaluated expression and you go on with the rest of definitions. So once you've built the top environment, uh, you only need to find the last definition, find uh, its name, uh, glue some, uh, glue the inputs to it and uh, it's better to have them quoted so that they stand uh, for themselves. And that's it. The value of the whole program, the output of the program, is just evaluating this last, uh, this, th th this expression consisting of name of the last procedure with the input. So let's see if it actually works. I evaluate this and that. Good. Okay, uh, can you see this, this uh, line at the bottom? Because we can use some, perhaps, oh, now it's better. All right, so that's all about the, the small lisp. And uh, now I would like to introduce another language. Uh, I will show you an example. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Uh, the language is called FCL. It stands for flowchart language. It has been developed by uh, the School of Copenhagen. Uh, they invented it to simplify their investigations in automated program generation. And uh, programs in FCL consist of three parts. The two small parts are the names for the inputs of the program. Uh, the second one is the starting program point. So you start executing the program at this uh, program point, and the rest is uh, the block map. The block map is a mapping from program point names to codes, uh, to, to blocks of code. And each block of the code consists of zero or more uh, assignment um, statements, comments, assignment comments, and. Uh, their aim is to modify the global environment. And after this zero or more assignments, we do have one of three possible uh, jump um, commands. Uh, return is just terminating the execution of a program and returning the value of some expression. In this case, it's the expression R. And uh, you do have also uh, unconditional jumps and conditional jumps. So. I know it reminds me uh, of basic, perhaps. It's that sort of things. Uh, OK, so um, why should we be interested in this language? Mostly because uh, well, it does operate on the same, uh, we can make it operate on the same uh, algebra as Lisp is, the algebra of uh, symbolic expressions. So you can uh, do all this cons, car, stuff. And uh, programs in SCL seem to be relatively easy to be compiled into assembly or some bytecode of, of uh, anything, uh, or to C. And you can perform many uh, smart things that I don't know anything about because I don't know how to do compilers. So that's, uh, that's because I started this project. Uh, because I didn't know how to write a compiler, but I wanted to have my programs compiled. Um, so how do we go about implementing this language? This one is pretty easy. Looks like this. Once we're having a Lisp interpreter, it's relatively easy because many parts are common. Uh, the first thing uh, we would like to have is oh, just is to be able to evaluate uh, FCL's expressions. So this is a performance version of uh, Lisp evaluator. Let's call it evalexp. And it takes an expression and the global environment and tries to evaluate it. Mm, perhaps let's make it more fancy. Expression, expression. OK, so uh, in a large part, it's the same as in, as in uh, Lisp. It's just, uh, you know, ground uh, terms mm, evaluate to ground terms. Uh, only we do not have closures, and the primitive operator is not allowed in the value position, so we don't need to do this. And, uh, Actually, we do not uh, have a top environment. The, the nth variable stands for uh, the, the global environment. Oh, I started doing it in here. OK. <laughs> no closures, no primitive operations as values. So just the, uh, the value of a symbol is whatever the lookup tells you it is. And now the primitive operations. So just take these ones. And now we've got a nasty job to do because the last time uh, arguments were evaluated by the map uh, function in here. So we need to uh, evaluate them explicitly. All right, are you following? Good. Now, I'm sorry I have to do this like, like this, but it's, it's a dirty coding. So. 
this and this and yes some more almost there okay and this one is too small for me <laughs> add sick sick oh he doesn't like something ah yeah no it should be uh should remember it nope Ah, uh, yeah, I get you. Uh, okay, yes, thanks. So now this thing probably should work, just let's try it. Um, uh -huh. Ah, good. Uh, so now uh, half of the code for the FCL implementation is behind us. Now uh, things are going to be easy. Uh, all we need is uh, to be able to execute a single block of code, which is relatively simple. You just um, run block, perhaps. Just take that block and uh, the current state of the environment. And I will be passing uh, the whole block map around because of the go-to thing. Um, so yes, it's useful. So the blog can, can uh, start with some um, assignment comment. It might be, oh, perhaps I'll do it like this. So it's let some variable, some expression, and the rest of the block. In which case we just run this rest of the block with respect to updated environment. So, uh, I don't know if I, so like this. Mm, update variable with the value of this expression with respect to our, our current environment. And that's the new environment and we're passing the block map around. Okay. And that was the hardest part because the rest is simple. You can have a return statement, in which case you simply return the value of this expression with respect to global environment. Uh, yes, it should be like this. And you can have a go to. Uh, which means just to run the the block pointed out by this program point. So it's a run block, Let's look up this thing in the block map and pass the current state of the environment and the block map. Good. And the last case of conditional jump is very similar, only we are having this condition and two program points. So we're in the lookup would uh, have to first evaluate the condition and check whether it's nil or not. So, if it's nil, then we pick second branch. If it's not nil, we treat it as the truth value, so we pick up the, the truth branch. Um, yeah. All right, and we're almost there. We just defined the, the uh, run procedure that is uh, our interpreter proper. It takes a program and some inputs and does something like, like this. Uh, takes the names of the arguments, just look. So it's the first element of the program, as the program is a list. And uh, you take the initial program point, which is the second. I'm sorry, I'm, uh, sometimes I use a matcher and sometimes I use car and kudr. <laughs> and uh, we can now build the initial environment. So it's just uh, binding the argument names with inputs. 
inputs. Good. And we look up the first block. Oh yes, we need the, pro the block map. The block map is just everything else in the program. And block map. This environment and the block map. Let's see. Now, uh, you probably do realize what does this program do. It computes the uh, nth power of the number m, and it seems to work. So our interpreter is uh, luckily OK. <laughs> uh, good. So now we can talk about uh, the strange relations between these two languages, which is the core of this, uh, of this whole show. Uh, I don't know if it fits well. Can you see anything now? OK. Um, so obviously, these two languages are very different from each other. They only work on the same uh, domain, on the algebra of symbolic expressions, but the whole, uh, the whole uh, thing about control flow is completely different, and uh, Lisp is, is, is very local. Like, it creates only a small environments, and they, are, they just disappear after the evaluation, and FCL has this uh, static, concrete, uh, global environment, and uh, Lisp has uh, an uh, evaluation function which calls itself recursively, so probably you need some form of a call stack to manage these things. And uh, the FCL is, is just like, uh, you know, it's like a Lisp program but with only uh, tail calls. So what could we do to um, transform a Lisp program into FCL to have some fun? Well, we need to get rid of these two things. So first of all, uh, to get rid of, uh, of non-tail calls in order to forget about the, the, the stack management. And then we need to get rid of lambdas, which create local small environments, and to be able to uh, operate on them using uh, a global environment. Mm. Oh. Uh, I don't know how um, a modern scheme compilers work. As far as I'm concerned, they are doing something similar to what I found out. And what I found out is uh, if you take a Lisp program and uh, convert it to continuation passing style, then the problem of stack is gone. Because the last, time, uh, the last thing each uh, lambda does is just to call its continuation. So it's, it's a take call. Uh, and <laughs> I don't know, you know, uh, sometimes I can do it on paper, but I didn't know how to uh, mechanically perform uh, the CPS transformation. But I found some paper by Mr. Uh, Oliver Danvi, and uh, there are lots of papers on, on anything he, he, he had written. So I just took his equations, extended them to Lisp, and implemented a very simple uh, CPS transformer. It's ugly, it's horrible. Uh, So let's take some simple Lisp program, <laughs> the one with closure. Um, can you see it? <laughs> MKADR constructs a closure uh, which takes a single argument and then adds it to whatever it, it keeps in, uh, in, in, in its bindings. And the main just uh, you know, calls this uh, MKADR thing to construct two procedures, the first one decreases its argument by two, and the second one by three, and 
finally recounts the thing. So as you can see, the, the body of, of uh, main procedure is not tail recursive. So let's see, oh, it's too long. Uh, all right. <laughs> Now, this looks horribly, but uh, it doesn't require a call stack, right? And it's a very naive way to implement CPS, and uh, I'm more than sure that there are better ways to omit some steps, but uh, basically it works, and I don't care. And you will see why, uh, why is that so uh, in a few minutes. So, the first problem is solved. Now all we're left to do is to get rid of lambdas, and the bad thing is now we do have a lot more of lambdas. Uh, but smart people have invented uh, a trick to convert a higher order functional program into the first order one. So uh, they get rid of the closures by replacing them with a small data structure which has some identifiers so that it knows uh, what lambda form had created it, and it keeps the values that would be, you know, normally locked inside the closure. And uh, there is also a marvelous paper by uh, Olivier Denvi, uh, Three Steps to CPS Transformation, something like this. So I read it and had implemented it horribly, but it seems to work. Uh, so if you apply our original program, not, not the one in the CPS form, what we get is this. Um, there is only single lambda, it's called apply, and its aim is to you know, recognize the data structure representing the closure and to act as if the closure was applied to some values. Okay, so uh, for example, our MK other uh, procedure has now become, maybe I will show the original. Uh, okay, the MK other uh, now just becomes uh, some label with the uh, empty inner environment or, or inner binding. And the meaning of this label is in here. It just means, you know, um, you're gonna get some arguments, so uh, create this data structure representing some other closure and enclose the first of your arguments, the only one that you actually have, uh, with this label. So now, uh, each place which was the application site of this lambda is replaced with the call to apply. And apply is being given this uh, this uh, data structure representing the closure. And it's, uh, it takes a list of values that we want to apply this uh, closure to. Okay, so it looks uh, not very nice and if, if we perform both of these transformations, we get a monster. Uh, Okay, <laughs> but the good thing about the monster is it's now uh, extremely easy to convert it to FCL. So what you do is you look at the, this, this apply uh, function, uh, you convert its uh, if structure into some big uh, block of, of uh, of ifs that dispatches depending on the label and then it, you can create uh, for each branch of this, of this if thing you can create a single block which only takes two things, two lists, arcs and, uh, and label and produces two more because the last thing it's gonna do is to call itself. So it's like a big switch statement where the, uh, each branch ends with go to to the beginning of this switch statement. Uh, so I did it. Uh, mm -hmm. 
and this way a very horrible FCL program is being constructed. Uh, well, let's see if it works. First let's try our program on in its original version. What does it take? Oh yes, it's called X. And is that correct? Okay, so it like works like this. It takes uh, the input and then creates two copies of it. One is uh, incremented by two, the other by three, and we constant. So the newly generated program should work just the same. Ah, three. Good. However, uh, it's like four, five, six, s over six screens of code um, to perform a very simple uh, set of operations. So it's, it's horrible. Uh, I mean, most of its runtime, this program only takes care of itself. It just uh, looks up the labels in order to find out what the control flow is and uh, it, does, it, it constructs this uh, new list of arguments, uh, so consists some things, then gets to them back by using car. And it's horrible, I can't even show you where, where the real computation is in, in this thing. So, wouldn't it be nice if we could take this program and you know, use some tool that would extract the real meaning of this program. The real thing that is to be done is, you know, take this thing, add two, add three, cons, boom, done. And it is possible. Ah. This program, echo, the argument is called x, okay? I'm just telling it now, I don't know what x is. It's just something. Here it comes. That's the, the essence of, of the program we had uh, just generated with my clumsy way of compiling things. The essence is just like this. Take some input, uh, this guy, and you know, cons its copies incremented by two and three respectively. How do you like it? Good. Depend on the, the, the FCL or the, Excuse me? Does it depend on the syntax on FCL or is this actually functionally? Is it dependent on FCL? On, on FCL? Uh, the method itself, no. It was developed in late 70s in, in Russia in uh, a very specific but beautiful language called Refal. And uh, there are partial evaluators for many languages uh, like now. and. Some of them are getting into the mainstream as the Haskell guys have implemented for now experimental uh, partial evaluator uh, modules for uh, the Glasgow Haskell compiler. Uh, but no, I just picked FCL because it's so simple uh, to both interpret it and to uh, interpret it in an abstract way. So. I will just show you. Uh, don't get too enthusiastic because my specializer is still broken. <laughs> yes. Uh, the whole aim of the project was to have a partial evaluator which always terminates and it uh, either does not terminate always or it has some issues and sometimes it forgets things and gets into pieces of code that are impossible and then things get nasty. But I think I know how to get rid of that. So maybe, maybe, just maybe this will work. Uh, a few examples that uh, work right now, uh, just to show you that, uh, how many of you have seen a partial evaluator before? Ah, good, good. So uh, probably the power example is a known one. Okay, so once again we're having this 
a power computing program. And let's see what happens if we inform it on one of its, uh, on, on the value of one of its inputs. Yeah. Mm. So, first I can tell it that uh, I don't know what the base is. So it's just something. But I do know uh, the exponent, the value of exponent. And let's say it's five. All right. Ah! <laughs> okay. So, whoop. experiment is once more. Because the whole control flow of wow, the whole control flow depends on the value of the exponent, which was known. Uh, the partial evaluator was able to, uh, you know, just follow the whole process and to remember to 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 accumulate the computations that are uh, really uh, meaningful to this program. That is, uh, that the uh, result depends on them. So what it did, it found out it's uh, okay, n is two. Uh, so we take the, the false branch, let's loop it, we decrement uh, n, and we mm, accumulate some computation about r. Uh, we get back to the test, n is one, so it's not zero. We repeat, and after those steps, uh, those five steps, we get this expression. Uh, and. This example you probably have seen with uh, many other partial evaluators, but the next one was a very pleasant one to me because my, my previous attempts did not terminate on this case. Suppose we do know the base, its value is five, but we do not know the exponent. I mean. So the re resulting program is uh, a bit uglier than the original uh, because this uh, test block got uh, residualized twice, but it basically states the same thing as the original program. The only difference is it tried to propagate the constant that we know as far as it could and it was only inlining it in the multiplication expression. Good. Now, how does this thing work? Are you interested? Okay. Uh, the slides, no, no, no. I have prepared an animation for you. <laughs> uh, so the basic idea is, uh, the basic idea is this. Uh, we will uh, develop a graph. Uh, at first it's a, it's a tree, which represents a possible uh, processes generated by this program. And each uh, vertice of this graph represents uh, a particular set of states uh, the program can be in. So it's a, a particular program point and uh, some bunch of possible environments. So in this case, we, we start with uh, the unknown uh, base. So it covers uh, all, of, uh, all possible values for M and the known n. And uh, as, as you see, uh, the next uh, block is test, so we, we drive to the test. Uh, now we know the value of n, so uh, we forget about the true branch, we pick up the false branch and uh, go on driving. So we get to this loop program point. Uh, loop does what it has to do. Uh, it, uh, perform some operation on R, it decreases N, then we test again, we know one is not zero, so we fall into loop once again, and finally the value of N is zero, so we pick only the true branch, reaching the endpoint, and generating the residual code. Uh, and this was the, the nice example, because the code got shrinked into just a single block, but many more interesting things happen in the second case. So we now start with the unknown exponent and uh, the known basis. What do we do? Well, we follow from init, from init to test, 
and uh, as test depends on the value of n, which is unknown, we have to look at the both branches. So we first pick the false one, and uh, we get this loop construct, which does something, something, and then we're in a test again. And now notice, uh, these two states, these two sets of states, are quite similar. Uh, because the value of m is the same, the value of n was unknown, and now it's unknown with some accumulated uh, computation, so it's still unknown. And the, R, uh, the Rs are in strange relation, because the later one is, uh, is bigger. So uh, it's not uh, safe to, uh, to drive this process graph further because uh, probably we will get into infinite loop and that is the case because we will still be accumulating this uh, subtraction thing over n and the error will be growing and we don't get anywhere. So if we see two states that are uh, similar in some sense, then we need to get back to the ancestor, to the first time we were in test and forget something. Like we know the value of m, it, it, it's not the case because it's the same. The value of n, yeah, it seems safe, so we need to forget about the value of r. And that's what we do. In order to forget it, we need to do something with it because the program, uh, the actual process generated by the program, it, it knows what r is. So we create additional uh, block of code which assigns this value. We, we kind of drop this knowledge about r's value uh, to somewhere else, to the residual code. And now we drive the, the test point. Uh, so again, the value of n is unknown, so we have to check both uh, branches. Start with the uh, else one. Uh, we do the looping, and we're in test again. And you know, they are still similar, but now it's way better. Because the only difference is the new uh, test has some computation accumulated around n and some around r. So what we can do is to just forget about this knowledge, leave it in the residual code, and go to back to the original test. And this way we have finished driving the, the else branch because no, now it's closed. So the only thing, thing we're left with is the true branch of the original test, but it's trivial because it's uh, just end, and uh, it's end where we don't know anything about the value of R, so we just need to return it as it is. <sighs> Good. Uh, are there any questions? All right. Now, uh, these notions of uh, two configurations, that is, sets of possible program states being similar, uh, have been formalized in, in many ways, and uh, it's a rigid notion of being close enough. And uh, probably I'm having some error in implementation of this part. OK. Now, the last thing is. Uh, Suppose I manage to, because where's the unusual compiler thing? It, it, it was ordinary and very crappy compiler so far. The unusual compiler thing is, suppose I manage to uh, fix this uh, cowgirl program. Uh, actually, it's called cowgirl or invader. Uh, if I manage to finish it, I will no longer need to have this CPS transformation and defunctionalization thanks to the uh, phenomena called first Futamura projection. And this is the real uh, black magic. I, know, I have some equations, but the idea is this. Suppose I am having an interpreter for Lisp written in FCL. I know, maybe I sat for a week and just coded it by hand or generated it with my crappy tools. Uh, when it's written in FCL, it can be subjected to my partial evaluator, right? Uh, so, in particular, I can uh, tell my uh, partial evaluator to, you know, take this interpreter and uh, the part of the data you know is the code of some Lisp program and the part you don't know are its inputs. 
So it will produce some program which uh, takes the input and returns the same that uh, the interpreter would return in case it was given this program and this input. So it's by the definition of interpreters. Uh, that's exactly uh, the semantics of this newly generated program is the same as the semantics of our original list program, only in, uh, in FCL. So I don't know, is it cool? All right, so uh, to recapitulate, uh, the thing I, would like, I, I wanted to say is that first of all, I believe compilers uh, should do more and they can. And that uh, finally I would be able to write my programs that look like mathematical definitions and have the compiler to figure out the uh, more or less effective way to to perform the computations, to extract the essence of this computation. And the second thing uh, is that computer programs are strange entities. Thank you. So um, are you guys using a partial evaluator um, when you're doing your textual um, analysis? Uh, not yet, because it's broken, but uh, yes, the plan is to use it. Okay. Because of its uh, capability to compile stuff. Uh, there have been some research on using partial evaluation for uh, code obfuscation. It's, that's the, the, the interesting trend, but uh, yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> Uh, no, no, I, I, I have never used it. I once saw uh, the Similix thing, and I think that's all. Uh, does it terminate when the control is... Uh, I, don't, I don't know about its termination hmm? properties, but I think the same folks who are involved with the book you referenced as too long didn't read. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think they would uh, I think it's pleasant ah. and pleasant. If, if it was made by the same guys, then probably it's uh, a variant of Similix or a prototype for Similix. I don't know. Uh, I'm not much interested in uh, offline partial evaluation, and their book is entirely about it. Uh, you cannot uh, you cannot use certain informations when you're doing uh, it this way because you have this binding time analysis time where you don't know the particular values. You only know they are uh, uh, they are static. So you once and for all generate this template. It just doesn't. Uh, it, it isn't aggressive enough. Sorry? It isn't aggressive enough. Uh, Supercompilers are a hot topic, and uh, they are doing. Uh, I, I just got this. Uh, I just got this uh, ideas um, using the uh, graph, the, the the process graph, and the generaliz generalization step from the supercompilers. You mean read scheme org, right? Uh, the read scheme library. Um, so, can you recommend any particular things? Uh, <laughs> I think the, the 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 links that I posted are uh, are kind of cool because they are very short presentations, and you can you know just read it during the weekend, and uh, another week and try some code, and and uh, you're on board. And this too long they didn't read the book on program generation is it's, it's very cool uh, but it's long and it's only on offline partial evaluation which is uh, it used to be popular in the 90s because people believed that you cannot uh, perform Futamura projections using online uh, uh, partial evaluators however uh, in 2011 a very smart guy from Austria who hangs out with the Copenhagen school what was his surname? Robert Gluck. Robert Gluck uh, did a, an online, very simple online partial evaluator for FCL, which uh, did, um, which was auto projector, so that you can you could use it on itself. Uh, the trick was he extended the the FCL language to have some form of tail calls, and 
That way he didn't have to manage uh, uh, the list of, of, of pending things to be, uh, to be specialized. Uh, instead of having list, he was using uh, the call stack of the, um, the host language uh, and that way he succeeded in, in, in self-application. I did play around with, with his code because his paper uh, just has this big printout of FCL code. It was very pleasant. It reminded me of uh, being a child and uh, rewriting basic code from papers. So, yes, uh, now I think online partial evaluation is, uh, it seems more useful. Along or in the meetup.com announcement that we should be able to find. Okay, are we good? Yep. Like one question. Sorry, you mentioned this earlier. I was wondering about uh, the role of side effects in mm -hmm. thinking about language no. design and implications for part. Uh, I, I didn't mention it, and I believe this will be a little problem because you can sometimes omit some. Uh, Suppose a language hosts a comment like read, which just reads a symbolic expression from the standard input. Uh, when you specialize a program, you can have a few reads omitted. Uh, I have no idea what to do with this thing right now. But if your application made side effect free language, and that, that would be completely fine for what you're doing. Yes, yes. That, that's, that's why the, the point was to rather to compile list programs than to have a, a real uh, universal partial evaluator for FCL itself. But yes, precisely the order of comments might change because of this accumulating computations thing and so you, drop, uh, you drop some of the information into the residual code at uh, almost random moments. So yes, things will get complicated with that. However, you can uh, probably you can uh, manage some things uh, Reusing the fact that it was generated from the CPS form, maybe. I don't know. Uh, I will have this problem later on when I fix it. <laughs> <laughs> That's it